Yeah, well, I was a jazz drummer and I wanted to go to America. So I read that British Airways was uh, taking on air stewards to fly to America for the first time. So I thought, oh, this is great. Because you fly there one day, spend three days in New York, fly back three days in London. So I saw this, the new international jazz drummer. So I applied there and they said, there's no vacancies at the moment, but if you take a job at British Airways, you get taken on first. So they gave me a job in the photographic unit. So that's where I started. Then I went down the airport, then I photographed somebody, turned out to be quite famous. The next thing I know, a newspaper guy saw me take the picture, the picture published, and the guy wanted me to work down there every Saturday at the airport. Then I met the local hotshot at the airport and he was, all the movie stars wanted him to go down the movie set so he could photograph them on the movie sets. So I teamed up with him. He died in a plane crash. And the next thing I know, six months later, I've got his job at the Daily Sketch. And I was 20, 21. And uh, I said to the picture of I don't really know what I'm doing, Len. I said, I've only just started and I don't really know. He said, don't worry, I'll take care of you. He said, why well, I've got you here? He said, if, A, you're a musician and we think pop music is going to be big in the 60s. And tomorrow I want you to go down to Abbey Road and photograph a group called the Beatles who are recording Please Please Me. And that was the very first job I did. And that published, paper sold out. Phone rings two days later. It's Andrew Oldham who manages the Stones saying, can I do for the Stones what I did for the Beatles? So I did, got a double page spread, and I was off and running. I started with the two top groups in the world, never looked back. I suddenly realised that there weren't any shots, there weren't any groups. There was no point of reference. A, a pop picture had never been in, in an English newspaper ever. So I thought, what am I going to do with them? So I, I got them outside the studio and lined up, you know, in the order of how the band was run. And that was it. I mean, it's such a naive picture, simple, naive picture. But that was the first shot of a pop group ever. They were as opposed to the Beatles. You knew there were five of them. Whereas the Beatles all sort of merged into one, you know, they all talked together, laughed together. But you knew with the Stones there were five individuals and that's the way I treated them. And they were blues men, actually, that's the way I photographed them. They were all my ideas. I mean, you know, they, they, it was all brand new world to them. So I just followed them around and did what I did. The pictures we took formed the image of the group. You know, the Beatles all wore suits, looked, at, looked the same. The Stones were all totally different. You know, wild things. In fact, when I first took their picture, I took the pictures back to the guy at the Daily Sketch. And he said, God, they look like five prehistoric monsters, which I suppose they did at the time. Well, I did, I did improvise, <laughs> which is the whole secret of good jazz anyway. But uh, I mean, I, I, I never really felt a photographer. I mean, I just took pictures of, of what I saw, you know, and I obviously saw things in a good way, but I had no idea. I mean, I thought when I met Bailey and Donovan and Duffy and all these guys, because they worked in studios, I thought that was proper photography. And I was nothing compared to them, you know. I mean, I did have the eye. Well, I was good at art at school. That's where I got the eye. And I always filled the frame with the camera, although I wanted to say that's what I did do. So maybe that was it. I can't believe the success I've had. You know, it's only when I stopped and I looked back and I realised that I photographed all these people. You know, London it had become the centre of the whole of show business. So I got jobs to work on films as what they call a special photographer. And that's the way I shot all the movie stars. Ava Gardner, I met, I met her in a film in Spain and we really became friendly. I said, I've got a chance to photograph uh, your husband in a couple of weeks' time. I've got an assignment for life called Night and Day with Frank Sinatra. So she said, oh, I'll write you a letter of introduction. So she writes this letter 
and I'm waiting on the film set and he arrives on the set surrounded by minders and God knows who. And I thought, what have I let myself in for here? But he turned out to be the most charming man. And I was with him for the next 30 years after that. I often wish I knew what was in that letter, but I don't know. He said, right, you're, he told his guys he's with me. And I was. He let me into his life and I went everywhere with him, but we barely spoke. But I realised he'd give me the greatest gift he could ever give me, if anyone, was to be with him everywhere. And that's when I realised that he was truly in love with Ava Gardner, really. My pictures of Serge Gainsborough and Jane Birkin just show them without trying to show up their age. It became very popular in France, that picture. I mean, it didn't mean a lot to the English, but it meant a lot to the French. I think it was the older man and the younger girl was the attraction there. And they really made great pictures. And he was very keen, Serge Gaines, but a very nice guy. And uh, it really worked well. One time I was in LA and I was there with Bowie. Liz Taylor. I said, Terry, I'd love to meet David Bowie because I've got a part from him in a film I'm doing in Russia. So I said, all right, I'll bring him to your house. He said, no, don't bring him there. Bring him over to George Kukor's house because he's the director. And, and so, OK, I said, George's place, one o'clock Monday. So one o'clock comes, two o'clock comes, three o'clock comes. No sign of Bowie. Let, eventually, quarter to six, he shows up. Of course, he's out of it and everything. Anyway, she grabs him. We did a few pictures. She took over the whole thing. Well, the light goes, as you know, it, about quarter to six in L.A. And I was working in that light, 30th at 2.8. It was how I got those pictures, I don't know. Yeah, but that was all in like five minutes. And they didn't really become friends. She, he didn't get the part in the movie. But they did become really good friends later. The manager rang me up and said, we're doing this album called Diamond Dogs. I need you to photograph a dog laying on the ground, then get David to copy the dog laying on the ground, and then we're going to give it all to a artist called Guy Pelaire to draw a cover. So he turns up in the studio with the dog and everything, so we do all the shots. And afterwards, I thought, well, I'll do a shot for the back cover or something like that. And so I'd get Bowie and the dog, and... And what's happened there with that, why the dog's jumping up is he's jumping up at the strobe. Every time the strobe went off, the dog tried to bite it. So that was the secret of that picture. But that's one of the best selling rock and roll pictures ever. Didn't even turn a hair. I think he was out of it then as well. He was a very intelligent guy, very nice guy. The funny thing is, I'm the only photographer alive who's photographed all the Bonds, from Sean Connery right through to uh, Daniel Craig, and uh, I feel proud of that. I first met Sean, I got sent down by the Daily Sketch to photograph him on From Russia With Love, and that's when I met him. And it was the start of a friendship that, you know, it all went on and on and on. I would say he was the best one. And then Roger, I knew, I mean, I knew them all. And they're all different. I mean, Daniel Craig does a great one. Roger Moore does a different one. I mean, they're all different, but they all bring something of their own to it. When I was down, down, down Pinewood to work on the uh, Bond movie, I, walk, I arrived there and I walked past the set and they were shooting a series of pictures of the moonwalk with a couple of astronauts on the moon. So I thought, I've got an idea. Because Sean would do anything to do with golf, right? So I rush over to his room. I said, I'm going to shoot you playing golf on the moon. Because the day before, the guy had landed on the moon. So all the pictures in the paper were the guy on the moon walking around. So I said, I'm going to shoot you driving off on the moon. You know, and we use the astronauts, it's your caddy. And he couldn't wait. He grabs his clubs and we get over there. We took two minutes, we do this shot, and it turned out to be another bestseller. I also to photograph Sharon Tate pregnant a couple of days before she died. And we were working, and she said, I, I said, well, I'm going on Thursday to L.A. myself. She said, well, I'm having a party on Saturday. Please come to us. I said, sure. Anyway, I get there, and then I find out there's somebody I didn't want to see. 
going to the party. So I rang her up on the Friday and said, listen, I'm sorry, I'm so jet lagged I won't be able to make the party. Anyway, two o'clock that morning I get a call that she's been murdered. I mean, could have been me. I mean, it's incredible. I've had a lucky life. I mean, I hate, I mean, to die like that. Tracker Walsh said to me one day on the set, Myra Breckenridge, she said, I'm going to get crucified for wearing that bikini in a million years BC. Immediately, my mind jumps to this picture of her on the cross. So I got 20th Century Fox to build a cross on the next set, right? So I did these pictures and then I got nervous, right? Because I was born a Catholic and I felt this is very irreverent. So I didn't do anything with them until the last couple of years. Now it's a different time now, so I released them. I love Bardot, but I could never speak with her. She only spoke French. And every film I went on, she was with a new boyfriend. They disappear off in the trailer. But I did get one of the great pictures of her of all time, so I'm really happy. That was just luck. I was standing there, and all posed for this close-up. I'm surrounded by about 70 people. I mean, you, it looks like there's no one around there, but it was packed. I'm waiting to take this picture. Suddenly the wind blew, and I shot it. And I had to wait three months to see the result because I was away. And I couldn't believe it when I saw it. The shot of Faye by the pool. I was working on a thing for People magazine. And I said, this was before the Oscars, right? I said, if you win the Oscar, I've got this idea for a picture. Because I'd seen the Oscars and all, all you ever saw was that shot of them holding up the Oscar, smiling at the cat. And I was bored with it and I knew the next day that the penny had dropped and all the offers were coming in. And I mean, people's money went from $100,000 to $10 million. I mean, everything in their life changed. They got offered every script. And I wanted to do sort of a picture that was typical of that. So I arranged with Sven, who ran the pool at the Beverly Hills Hotel, to do a picture there at 6.30 in the morning of a deserted pool with her with the Oscar and all the newspapers t saying about the Oscar and all the rest of it and she was looking dazed and it turned out to be one of my best pictures ever. This was the, when I photographed George Harrison who was a really nice guy. He wanted me to take some pictures of him in his new home down in Henley but that was when he was going through his Indian period. I wanted the contrast of him dressed like that with a house. It was incongruous. Well, I wanted to do that because it was so dramatic, you know. I got sent over to do Paul Newman and Lee Marvin in a movie, and I got, I got the job of doing the poster. So they fly me over from England, and I walk on the set, and I meet Paul Newman. He said, listen, we're having trouble with Lee. He's falling out with everyone on the set, and you won't get anything. Anyway, he's across the other side of the set, Lee Marvin. So I go up to him and I walk over to him. I said, Lee, I'm F Terry O'Neill. I'm over from England to do the uh, poster art. So he looks at me and he says, are you English? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. So he says, pleased to meet you. He loves the English, right? So then I can feel the whole film set rising up behind me because I've broken through with him. <laughs> and I've got some great shots and they use that shot as the poster. The Queen was the only shot where I was really nervous in my life. I would, they write you a letter and they say, can I be at Sandringham at three o'clock on June, whatever it was. In those three months, I thought of over 400 things that could go wrong with a shoot. And I, I worry about everything and I get down there, walk in, she walks in. And the moment she says hello, I realise I'm with a real pro. It, you know, it, was a, it became a doddle. She was a fabulous woman. And then, then I realised, of course, she spends her life posing for pictures or statues or things, you know. Amy Winehouse, I did for, actually took the picture for Nelson Mandela, who I was working for that week. It was the week of his 90th birthday and I was his birthday present. So I was there to do anything he wanted. And she was singing in a concert. And she, what happened was, she got up out of bed, she was in the London clinic having treatment, and she got up out of bed, came and did the show, 
I said, I've just got to get a picture for Nelson and then you can sign it for him for his birthday. So we did four frames, or two frames, I think, two or four, I think. And that's all I did, because I always went to the photograph and she was a great talent. And that was the last person I really photographed. I mean, they're all great people, you know, I've had a great life and I met some great people.